Thank you for being here. It is, it, it's the first Sunday of 2020. Um, and it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> 2019 just ended and we, uh, we're here now. We're here uh, excited for what the year is, is going to hold. Excited for what God will do this year through us. And if you are... Uh, joining us on any of the challenges that we're putting forward this year uh, if prayer and fasting maybe you don't want to fast but you're like okay for 21 days I'm gonna I'm gonna put my focus on prayer um, I, or you want to fast you don't you know there's other ways to fast and I'm gonna mention that a little bit in my message today but um, there there's a lot of ways for us to get involved and and just to start the year off on the right foot you know um, so this, this month, it, in conjunction with all of that, working with all of that, we're starting a new series called Shutdown, uh, Seeking God Above All Else, Seeking God Above All Else. Now, this, this series is very near and dear to my heart. For those who know me, for, for my wife and, uh, they, and, and family, they know that I've been working on writing a, a book, a devotional book, and this is the title of the book that I'm working on. So I am not going to make any promises because I have said before when it's coming out, but this year <laughs> at some point. So uh, uh, shameless self-plug right there. Uh, but uh, uh, if you want to uh, just just pay attention to what I post and stuff, I, it'll, it'll be out eventually. But this is, this, the, the heart behind it is from... Uh, something that I started doing a long time ago, something that God put on my heart when I was just 14 years old. Um, and it was this idea of shutdown, um, the idea of, uh, of seeking after God, of, of, of shutting down the distractions in your life, of, of Turning off the TV, uh, you know, back then for me when I was 14, we're, we're still getting in a, a day and age where social media wasn't like so prevalent or, and the best technology we had was like TV and things like that. Th those were the distractions for me back then at 14 years old. Um, we weren't, it wasn't as, it wasn't as big, all, all the stuff that we have today. So... The idea behind shutdown was that it was about getting distractions away from ourselves, getting distractions away from myself and, and seeking after God. I, I turned off. Uh, I, I had a TV in my room at that time. I took the TV out of my room. I, I hid all my video games. Uh, I, would, I, I, I dedicated myself and I said, I'm only going to use uh, uh, my phone for making calls or sending text messages to family. Like I said, social media wasn't a thing at the time. Um, well, it was, but there was MySpace, and if you know what MySpace is, you're at least old enough to know, and some of you that don't know MySpace, like, I, I know that there are some teenagers that are like, what is MySpace? That's, that was, what is that? But here in the first Sunday of 2020, I want us to be able to do that. I want us to be able to seek after God with all we have, to cut out distractions, to, to, to change the way we're pursuing God. And so today, my message is about seeking God. It is about uh, how we can do that, how, how, just how uh, we can get started on that journey. How can we be, be better at it? And I know a lot of us might have that resolution, you know. Uh, we, we're all setting res resolutions, like our worship leader, Stephen, said. He's like, we've set resolutions, we've got goals, we've got plans, things like that. And one of, some of them might be, let, let's seek after God. But just, just for a little bit of fun, I was looking up, I was like, what are some funny resolutions that people set during this time of year? And I found a blog, uh, if you've never heard of him, his name is John Acuff, he wrote a, has a blog called Stuff Christians Like. And he says, these are some funny uh, resolutions that we set. And he says, I will drive nicer on the way to church, or at least I will take off the fish symbol on my car, the Jesus bumper sticker, so people don't know that I'm a Christian when I'm driving like a maniac. I won't use, let me pray about it, as a no. I don't know if you've ever done that. Someone asks you to do something in church, it's like, well, let me pray about it. You meant no. 
But you just didn't want to say that, so you wanted to sound more spiritual. Or, or uh, how about this one? I think sometimes we do this. I will not use the uh, hashtag blessed for things that God might not have been involved with. <laughs> hashtag blessed. I got concerts, uh, tickets to a Beyonce concert. I don't know if that was the Lord. <laughs> I, I, one of my favorite ones he put is not, not, I will not Jesus juke. And I don't know if you know what that means, but that's a term that he uses to make things like overtly spiritual or, or, or about God that weren't even about God wasn't even about God, you know. People talking about going to the movies, it was like, well, I'm spending my time in prayer. What? I wasn't talking about that. I'm just saying, I, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go hang out with my friends. Well, y'all better be reading the Bible together. What? Like, and it's just a funny thing. But these funny kind of things, they, they put us into this idea that we, we do, like even the funny things are about seeking God. We, we have this innate desire to seek after God. We, we want something more. See, I, I believe that this desire is created in us. It's not something that just comes from nowhere. I believe that God has put this desire in us for something more, something more of him since the very beginning. Because it, it doesn't make sense sometimes. We, we think, well, well I, I go to church. I, 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 I love God. I I've already got Jesus in my life. I've made a decision to follow Jesus. Yet for some reason, I feel like I want more. Why, why is that? I think I already have God. C.S. Lewis once said of that feeling, he said in his book, The Pursuit of God, he says, to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. He's thinking like we already think we have him, but there is still something in us that calls out to him. And for anyone that might be listening or might be here that, you know, they don't have that and they don't understand that, but they have something in them that says there, there has to be more. I believe that is the same feeling that we have been given by God at the very core of who we are. We are created to be satisfied only by God. There are, there are things that only God can do for us. There is a satisfaction that only comes from being in the presence of God, from experiencing the love of Jesus that we cannot find anywhere else. And this desire, this desire is for him because we were created with re for relationship. We were created for relationship. Every single one of us, not, not just believers, because I think we have this idea, I think uh, a bad idea that gets into Christian mindsets is that we are called to be in relationship with God. And we forget about other people and we forget about those people that don't know God and we think, you know, well, sometimes we think about it, well, I should tell people about Jesus, but I need to work on my relationship with God first. But every single person, no matter who you are, has been called to, to, and created for a relationship with God. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 to 28, the Apostle Paul was speaking to a group of people uh, that were, di were discussing religious and philosophical things. And he said, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and more and have move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And so the Apostle Paul here was talking to these people and telling them, your own philosophers and poets and, and religious minds have talked about this God who they are not even sure who he is, but they understand that he is something more. God has put this desire in every single one of us since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden. That was the framework that God created for relationship with God, with himself. God created for relationship with God. God created for a relationship with himself. He, he created the Garden of Eden where he put Adam and Eve, where he fellowshiped with them. He talked with them. They knew his voice. They knew his presence. Not only that, they were unashamed. The Bible says that they were naked and they were unashamed. 
They weren't ashamed from each other. They weren't ashamed in God's presence. They, they, they didn't have fear of God. They weren't afraid. They weren't afraid until they ate the fruit from the tree and decided to do their own thing. And then they said, God, we were afraid because we heard you coming. We knew your presence was here and we were afraid. But we were created and we're drawn in by the Holy Spirit. We're drawn by God. There, there, there are sometimes, there are so, stories that I've heard about people talking about how God drew them to himself. That they, they, they didn't even talk to somebody. There are stories that are out of the Middle East um, where Jesus has appeared to people in the Middle East. And he has, said, he has told them who he is, and they've come to know who he is because he has called out to them. John 6, tells us that. He says, no one comes to the Father unless I draw them to me. So I want us to understand as we get into this that that desire that you have is given to you by God. There is a reason why looking out for other things, why, why your job won't satisfy you. Why work, why work won't satisfy you. Why people and relationships with other people won't satisfy you. Why money won't satisfy you. Why these things won't satisfy you because it can only be satisfied by a relationship with God. But I think that we get scared of having a relationship with God. We do. I, I, th- I believe we do. We, we, we have... It's because there are, there are two things that stop us from really pursuing God. We have some misconceptions, and then we have obstacles. They're not the same thing. Misconceptions are how we understand God, things that we need to think and change our thinking. And then there are obstacles that sometimes we put in our own way from us seeking God. So the misconceptions I want to talk about real quick, we have some misconceptions about seeking God. The first misconception I want to talk about is that we believe that we have to be perfect in order to have a relationship with God. That is entirely false. There is nothing in the Bible that says that we have to seek God, and in order to seek God, we have to be perfect. If that were true, no one would ever be able to find God. No one would ever be able to have a relationship with God. But we tell ourselves that as if we, we don't know that we make mistakes all of the time. As if we don't know that we, we try to do things or we re- set out to do stuff in our lives and then we fail. We set resolutions and goals and, uh, for health and life and spirituality and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we feel like we let people down and we feel like we let God down. And then we think, how can God want a relationship with me? Look at this mess. <laughs> we look at ourselves in the mirror and it's like, you're a mess. <laughs> And it's true, we might be a mess, but that misconception needs to be challenged because nowhere in the Bible does it tell us we have to be perfect to find God. In fact, it tells us the opposite. It says, however you are, come to him. If you want a relationship with God, James chapter chapter 4, verses 7 to 10 tells us, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So it tells us here that James, the apostle James was telling us here, you don't need to be perfect, but in fact, bring your imperfections to God, and he's going to get closer to you. That's so reassuring me to to know that even in our imperfections and in our mess if we will come to God he will say yes I want to be close to you too ow I just hit the pulpit (laughs) God wants us and knows well he doesn't want us to be imperfect he knows we're imperfect we think that nobody knows us and so we try to put on a facade uh, of this, this good person that we try to be in front of other people. We try to be good people at work. We try to be good people in front of our family. And then we go to our rooms and we think, you know, in our quiet space, wherever we're at, and we think nobody knows the dysfunction that really is in my life. But God knows. God knows the dysfunction. God knows our mess. God knows our problems, our troubles, our worries, our stresses. He knows all of that. And he takes us anyway. We have to get away from the misconception that God is looking for perfection before he wants us to. If that were true, it would be worthless for us to be preaching the gospel to people. 
Because we would have to get people to go through all kinds of classes and training and stuff so that they could at least look perfect before they could even get to God. But he doesn't want that. He wants us to come to us, come to him as we are. The second misconception is that we believe God is hiding from us. You ever feel like you're playing hide and seek with God? And maybe it's not in so much in those words, but it's like you're praying to God and he's not answering. It's like, God, you know, I'm a little bit, str- I'm struggling here. I don't, know how I'm a, I know, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills next month. God, I'm struggling because I have difficult people at work. I have difficult people in my family. How am I supposed to deal with them without you? And then God seems nowhere to be found. We call out to God and we think he's just hiding from us. And we think, well, what hoops do I have to jump through for him to actually answer me? What do I have to do for God to pay attention to me? We struggle and we might struggle with that feeling. But I can tell you sure enough that God is not hiding from you. He's not hiding. He's not going anywhere. He's not trying to play a game of celestial hide and seek where you're like, well, I'm going to this church. Maybe God is here. And then he moves to another church. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, oh, you know what? If you had prayed in the living room, that's where I was, not in, the, not in your bedroom. He, he doesn't do stuff like that. But we, we have this idea that he does, that for some reason that God is hiding from us or doesn't want to talk to us. But like I said, our, 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 our sin isn't the thing that is making God hide from us. That sin the, or, or whatever it is that we're dealing with, that, that idea of imperfection, that in itself is his own obstacle that we're putting up ourselves that has nothing to do with God. God isn't hiding. In fact, he's looking for us himself. The Bible tells us that he will draw near to us if we will draw near to him, right? Right, right, right what I read before. If we will come near to God, he will come near to us. That doesn't sound like hide and seek because hide and seek is different. In fact, hide and seek is the opposite. When, when someone's it in hide and seek... You want to run away from that person. So if they get near your hiding space and they're so close to finding you, you move as soon as they go by so that you can avoid being found. But God wants us to be found. He leaves a a trail, a way for us to be able to find him. He tells us exactly where to find him, exactly where to look, exactly what to do. He's not making it hard, but we think for some reason it, it, it must just be me then. I don't know what I did to God. He just doesn't like me. God doesn't like me. God likes you. He loves you, in fact. So we think that God hides. And we think that another, another misconception is we think that God leaves. The same, it's the same kind of idea, but we think that he abandons us. God obviously doesn't want to have anything to do with me because of all the stuff that I've done in my life. And so we think, maybe if I go to church enough, he'll come back. Maybe if I start reading the Bible, he'll come back. Maybe if I uh, pray on my knees or throw my face on the ground. And uh, uh, what did they do in the, the Bible in the ancient times? Uh, they, ter- they wore sackcloth, which is like, you know, like basically like those bags, the sacks that potatoes come in. They wore that, put ashes on their head. Maybe if I do that, God will come back to me. But the, I, the problem with that is that it, it, it makes God out to be a liar, and God is not a liar. Because in Matthew 28, 20, he says, I will always be with you. So God doesn't leave us. We need, God, God does not leave us. He does not abandon us. So he's not hiding from us, and he's not leaving. He's not going anywhere. In fact, he is always with us. The moments that we think that God isn't there, he's still there. The darkest times in our lives where we feel like no one is around us, not even God, he's still there. That is reassurance telling you, like, think about it. If you had a hard year this last year in 2019, guess what? You're here. You're here. You might have had the most difficult year of your life. I know I had a rough year. It wasn't easy. But I'm here. God didn't abandon me. He didn't leave me. He's still here. I may not have always heard from him when I wanted to. I may not have always uh, experienced the presence of God when I, I felt like I needed it. But he didn't abandon me. And he hasn't abandoned you. 
you're here. These, are these, these three misconceptions are really important for us to get over because they give us this idea that God doesn't want us. When in fact, the Word of God tells us that He wants us so much that He sent His Son to break down barriers to find us, to seek after us, to love us, for us to know that we are something greater than what we think we are. We think we're nothing, but we're valuable to God. We think we're, not, we're, we're unloved, but He says we are loved. He has done so much to break that, so we need to change our thinking and remind us God wants me, and He wants to know me, and He wants me to know Him. Other thing that gets in the way of our relationship and the seeking of God are obstacles. There's, there's certain obstacles that we're going to talk about. There's three obstacles. And these three obstacles uh, are things that we put in front of ourselves to block ourselves from God. Those, those moments where I, I believe that we feel like God has left us or feel silent, a lot of times those are because we are putting a barrier in front of ourselves that's preventing us. God hasn't gone anywhere, and it's not pushing him away. He's still here, but we build a wall around ourselves and say, well, God can't come into this space. It's my space. Anybody have a personal bubble? You don't like anybody coming in your personal bubble? It's like it's just a little too close. Too close. You have to be at arm's length. I know some people got some real tight. Uh, some people, they don't have no personal bubble. They love hugs and whatever. And they're just like, I, like, I love loving people. And the other people are just like, no, you have to be back. And I think we do that with God sometimes without even realizing it. The first obstacle we put in front of ourselves is pride. I'm not a prideful person. I think a lot of us think we're not very prideful. I, I think uh, we might think about ourselves and it's like, oh, you know, I don't even think about that word pride. Like, what is pride? I don't got pride. I, I, some of us might be proud. We're like, uh, uh, soy mexicano and I'm proud. I'm proud of my country. We might be a proud. Of, we might feel proud of our country. We might feel proud of our sports team. Uh, we might feel proud of a, a bunch of other stuff. Like, there's stuff that we might have pride in, but we don't think about ourselves. And we're like, I'm not a prideful person, no. I'm not prideful. I'm all right. You know, I don't think I'm better than anybody or anything like that. But pride takes on a lot of different forms. And in specific, I believe pride blocks our way to God when we think that we don't need God for something or anything. Psalm 10.4 says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. So think about it this way. Instead of saying that like pride gets in the way, like I think I'm better than everybody. Instead, pride is like, I can handle this. I don't need God. Because we do that a lot, I think. We, we tell God, I can handle this, God. We, not, we may not even tell God. We tell ourselves, it's like, I can handle this. I don't need help. I have done that so many times in my life. Like, uh, I believe it was last year. We were, we were making some changes to the lobby and everything here around the church. And we used to have a big TV out in the lobby. I broke it. <laughs> because I was taking it down. And I was like, I got this. I got this. I can take care of this. It's not too heavy. I'm pretty strong. I got this. I don't need any help. And as I'm finally, I'm taking it down, it slips through my hand, and it hits the ladder while I was on. And I thought, oh, you know, I looked at it, and I was like, oh, it's fine. I did this. I, I was fine. I'm fine. It, it, it worked out. It worked out okay. I dropped it. Obviously, I could not carry it. And it turned out okay. Then I plumbed it in and turned it on, and the LCD screen on the inside was cracked. The screen on the outside was fine, but the screen on the inside was cracked. And I think that's how pride is in our lives. We, we put up these barriers and we say, God, I'm okay. But really, there's something broken on the inside. We, we put up this barrier and say, I can do this. I don't need anyone. I don't need God. That is a very toxic mentality that has entered this culture. Today, we think we can do everything on our own. We think we can, we, we, we're just good enough by ourselves. I don't need anyone. And it, and, and it comes from a bad place. It comes from pain. 
It comes from hurt that we've experienced in our lives. So we put this pride barrier around us as all I need is me. What I have, I've earned. It's mine. God didn't give it to me. It's mine. What I have, I worked for. I did the hard work. It's mine. And so this barrier of pride prevents us from going to God or prevents us from seeking out God on our own because what the moment our brain, our, our, our spirits decide that we actually need God, our whole body, our being is fighting against that, saying, no, we don't need God. But God can break down pride. Another thing that stops us, these barriers, uh, another barrier is sin. Now, 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 there's, I'm not going to sit here and list out a list of sins. There's all kinds of lists in the Bible about what sin is. But sin essentially is ourselves uh, missing the mark. It, it is us doing something that is contrary to the will of God. It's when we are living rather on what we want to do rather than what God wants for us to do. Isaiah 59.2 says, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you, he will not hear. The interesting thing I think about that is the prophet Isaiah says they have hidden God's face from you. It didn't say that God can't see you. It says that God can't hear you. Why can't God hear you? Because your own sin is closing your mouth, preventing you from speaking out. Sin has a funny way of doing things like that. Sin cuts us off from God, not because God isn't strong enough to defeat sin. No, that's what he did on the cross. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to take sin on himself, take it to the grave, destroy it, and come back to life to show that it had no power. But sin in our lives, when we allow sin to enter into our lives, it doesn't block God from us. It blocks us from, no, it doesn't block us from God because God is still here and God is still doing stuff, but it blocks up God from us. We can't see him because we have a covering on our face. We're convinced that what we're doing is okay or it's good for us or because I like it and I want to do it and this is my way of doing things and there's that pride again. And it puts a veil in front of us and God wants to be able to get past that with us. And he can. The third obstacle we put is idols. It's like I mentioned earlier in this message, we have these things that we put in front of God. It might be a relationship. We put people in front of God. Now, it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It can be a friendship, too. We can put friendships in front of God. We can put other people. We can put family in front of God. That's a big one. I think a lot of people, especially Latinos, are so big on family. There are a lot of cultures that have family focus. And fa family is so important to them that it trumps God. It trumps what God is doing. I have to do these things because this is what my family wants rather than what God wants. We put idols. We put money. We put success in front of God. But, you know... I think it's funny that uh, I've seen people that they put success as an idol in their life in front of God, and, and they worship success, and they're not even successful. They're like, success, yes, I, they, all they talk about is success. You know, like people who are entrepreneurs, they always talk about, I'm successful, I, I'm going to be a millionaire. Are you? You've been saying that for five years. I don't mean to bash on entrepreneurs or whatever. But the thing, the idea is, is that we put stuff like that in front of God. We create these idols that are more important. We talk about things sometimes we don't even have, and yet they have become God to us. They're the things that our, our life revolves around. Work becomes the thing our life revolves around. School, uh, education becomes the thing our life revolves around. Family becomes the thing our life revolves around. All these things, money becomes the thing our life revolves around instead of the one that we were called to seek after. These things will never satisfy us. These obstacles, these pride, the, the, the sin, these things might make us feel good for a time, but all of it is temporary. It's all temporary. And when Jesus came, he came for us to be able to, to, to put all of that to death. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, 
immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. We put all of these things and we make them idols. We make them a god to our lives. But these obstacles can die. These obstacles can be destroyed. The misconceptions can be destroyed because that's just how powerful the desire God has to be in relationship with us is. He wants to be near us. He wants us to know him. He already knows us, but he wants us to know him. He wants us to seek after him, to desire him, so that we can fulfill the desires that he has placed in us. And I think we make it more complicated than it needs to be. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a close here. We, we definitely make it more complicated than it needs to be. Because we already know the things that, that help us to seek after God. We already know, but we don't like to do them because it's not always easy. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. We have to get back to the basics. Like we've been talking about, we need to pray. Prayer is such an essential thing. It's, it's our lifeline to God. It's our connection with the Holy Spirit. It's how we talk to him, express ourselves. And it doesn't just have to be, I think a lot of times we think prayer is just asking God for things, but God, prayer is not that. Prayer is pouring our lives out to him, the one who wants to listen. If you've ever felt like there's, I don't have anybody in my life that listens to me. The Holy Spirit is here to listen to you. To your anxieties and worries and troubles and fears. To the things that scare you and, and, and make you want to sh like shrink away, run away and hide from life. He is the one that is here to listen to us in all of that. We need to get into the word. These are basic things. We, we hear about them. We talk about them all the time. And in fact, I think I've preached like two or three sermons where I've talked about prayer in the word like recently, because I just feel like God has been telling me, you need to get back into that more yourself. You need to seek me out. Because these are the basic things. They're so basic, sometimes we forget about them. Fasting. Ah, oh, we hate fasting. It's like Jonathan said earlier, you might lose some weight, so there's a benefit. No. There's a lot of benefits from fasting. In fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, he says, I'm just going to focus on the first little phrase he says there. And he says, and when you fast. See, some people were under the impression that Jesus was teaching his disciples not to fast. But in fact, he said, no, how can they fast when the bridegroom is here? When the groom is here, how can they fast? They're celebrating. But when, they're, when I'm gone, they're going to fast. So when you fast. And he gave them instructions on how to fast. Fasting is essential. He tells us we need this. We need to be obedient to God. Sometimes we, uh, I love this. It was, it was something that me and my wife, uh, or that Pastor Melissa uh, told my wife, Lejinska, this. She said, or she heard her say this. Pastor Melissa Alfaro, she said, some of us are asking God for something when we haven't done the last thing that God has asked for us to do. And so we're in this weird limbo where God is like, I I've already told you what you need to do, but you're not doing it. You're, you're still complaining about the situation, but you're not doing the thing that I've asked of you to do. We need perseverance. We need to be able to not give up. That's hard. Because it's easy to give up. Yeah? It's easy to give up. When I was in high school, we went to a marching band game where at halftime, my school, North Shore, uh, won state championships this year again. Uh, they, my, our team was ahead at halftime, 46 points. And that's not the worst game I've ever been to. One game, there was 80, it was 89 to 0 by the end of the fourth quarter. But this one in particular was 46 points, and at halftime, they were like, we're done. They gave up. It's easy to give up. When you feel down and defeated or you feel like it's not possible to get where you want to go, it's easy to give up. But God wants us to persevere because in that perseverance, there is growth. There is change. There is hope. 
There is life. And the thing about it is, is that we do not have to persevere alone. Because not only has he called, not only is he with us, but he has also called us to be together a church, to encourage and lift each other up, to seek after him. We seek after God to become more like Jesus. We seek after God for the strength for life. We seek God to fulfill the to, to, to fulfill the unsatisfaction that is in the very core of our being. This desire, the, 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 it's there, and God wants us to know him today. He wants you to know that this year, it doesn't have to be the same as every other year, that you don't have to just say, I want to get closer to God, but he is making a way. And through the rest of this series, we're going to talk about what it looks like to seek after God? How, how do we actually conquer these distractions? How do we get past the, the difficulties, the sin in life? And how do we live it out daily? But He is here, first and foremost, seeking after us.